man. Father, I pray, Lord, for wisdom. I pray for the gift of teaching. I pray that you'd help me. I pray for those who listen, that you'd open their hearts to receive your word. My Father, as Christ said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. In thy holy name we pray. Amen. Okay, now I want you to, um, if you'll turn the book of uh, Luke chapter 22 with me this morning, please. <laughs> Luke 22. And verse number 36. Luke chapter 22 and verse number 36. Then said he to them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, likewise his script. And he that hath, an, hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this that is written must, be, must yet be accomplished in me, and he was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. I bet you haven't heard too many messages preached from there. And we'll get into it right here in a minute. But first of all, I'd like to read a, a, a statement that Netanyahu spoke to the United Nations October 3rd, 2013. And he's talking about all the nations of the earth are gathered against Jerusalem. And he sees his support and the people who are friends to Israel dwindling. And so, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, he called upon the fathers of his faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the only one outside of our faith as Christians that can do that. A Muslim cannot do that. The Persian king Cyrus, he said, issued a famous edict in which he proclaimed the right of the Jews to return to the land of Israel and rebuild the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. That's very true because that's what your Bible says he did. And then he talks about the new the prime minister, the new leader of Iran, is a wolf in sheep's clothing, and he is. And then he says that Israel will stand alone if they have to. And of course, they will never stand alone. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will stand with them, and Michael will fight for them. And then he said, they will be planted upon their soil, never to be uprooted again. And they have come back to a land that was promised to their father Abraham and that has been violently taken away from them. And now they talk about occupied territory. Uh, for example, the United Nations and most of the nations of the world say that Jerusalem is an occupied territory. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Always has been, always will be. Nations come and nations go. America will survive as a nation if it aligns itself with Israel the right way. If it refuses to align itself with Israel, America will go to the dustbin of history, as they say, like all the rest of the empires of the earth. Now, in Luke chapter number 22 and verses, uh, verses 36 through 38... The Lord Jesus Christ makes a shocking statement. And he says, uh, Let him sell his garment, verse 36, and buy a sword. And another one answered and said in verse 38, Lord, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. Now, what precipitated this? What's the context of it? Where does it fit uh, dispensationally? All these things are questions that we have to deal with. Look at John chapter number 18 and verse number 36. In John 18, 36.
Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants do what? Fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. That's clearly establishing a time period. The word translated kingdom here is cosmos. That word cosmos refers to the created uh, creation, but it also refers to a specific earth in time. In other words, this world right now. It's not the Greek word ion. Ion refers to an age. An age is a period of time, but not necessarily a physical thing. You can understand that in an abstract sense that we're in the age of grace. But it's not a physical thing, but it is a reality nonetheless. So he says here that his servants would fight, but now is my kingdom not from hence. Now turn to the book of Matthew, if you would, with me. Chapter... uh, Chapter number 5 and verse number 38. Matthew 5, 38. In Matthew 5, 38, you've heard it said that it hath been said, An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek Turn to him the other also. Now, this is one of those famous passages in the Bible that everybody knows. They never darken a church door, but they know you turn the other cheek. It's like the Good Samaritan. Uh, it becomes part of the culture, you see. And so, by on the surface of it, they think that if an assault is made upon you or upon your loved ones, that you are to turn the other cheek. And if you don't turn the other cheek, then you have violated the teachings of the Lord. Now, how do you deal with something like this? You see, that's what we're dealing with here this morning. This is what you call uh, hermeneutics. It's the doctrine of, 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 um, of, uh, of opening up the Scripture, digging into it, and revealing what it means. Now, we know the gospel of the kingdom in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is the kingdom of heaven. Don't we? We know that. We know that that is an earthly, visible, physical kingdom. And there's some certain rules about that kingdom that differ just a little bit from what we live in today. For example, I want you to look over here with me in the book of, uh, let's take, uh, uh, let's take, uh, let's take the book of uh, Hebrews chapter number 8 and verse number 10. Hebrews 8.10. All right. Hebrews chapter number 8 and verse number 10. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. Now watch this next verse. They shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Now do you understand that to be right now? Not at all. Not at all. Most of the folks in the church house don't even know him. Much less those who never go to church. Now, I want you to go to the book of Zechariah, chapter number 13. Zechariah, chapter 13. The last book in the Bible before the last book in the Bible. Zechariah, chapter 13, verse number 1. Now, watch this carefully. In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for the sin and for uncleanness. It shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land. They shall no more be remembered. Also I will cause the prophets, the unclean spirit, to pass out of the land. It shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, 
Then his father and his mother that begat him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and his mother that begat him shall thrust him through when he prophesieth. Now watch this. It shall come to pass in that day that the prophets shall be ashamed every one of his vision when he hath prophesied. Neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. And, uh, but, I, but he shall say, I am no prophet. I am an husbandman. For man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. And one shall say to him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. The message now becomes personal. It's a person. The person is present. It is no longer by faith. In the millennium, when the Jew is elevated to the head of all the nations, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be visibly seated in Jerusalem, and a light will go out from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth, and all a man has to do is see that light and follow it. It will take him straight to Jerusalem. And the nations come up to Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles and offer sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts, the Lord Jesus, that's sitting there visibly, physically glorified Son of God. No faith involved. It's all obedience. And when someone tries to prophesy, to, be, to, to speak forth a message, to bring forth some kind of a, a prophetic message, their parents are running through and say, we don't need that. Right there he is. Salvation will roar out of Zion. Now, obviously, that's not today, is it? Not at all. The Great Commission quoted thousands and thousands of times, Go to ye all the ends of the earth, preach the gospel to every, every creature. Preach. The Apostle Paul said to young Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, he said, I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, preach the word. It's our responsibility to preach God's word today. Preach his word. Disseminate it. Get it out. Get it as far as you can. And the Word of God will do the job. Now I want you to look at the book of Luke, chapter number 10, verse number 7. I'm trying to draw your attention to things that differ. Luke, chapter 10, and verse number 7. Political correctness grays everything. They cannot differ. They cannot differentiate. They cannot separate. <coughs> They create hate crimes and only apply them to one group. Luke chapter number 10, verse 7. In the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the labor is worthy of his hire. Now what's the next part say, next sentence? Have you ever heard a message preached on that? <laughs> I know you haven't. I'm, I haven't. Not, uh, not since 1973. I've never heard a message preached on Luke chapter number 10, verse number 7. Go not from house to house. I mean, you know, folks go out and they go house to house visitation, right? What does it say in Luke chapter number 10, verse 7? Go not from house to house. So obviously, there is an application to this. There's a time element involved. Because it says in the book of Acts, were they not going from house to house when they first met? Well, sure they were. The early church, they didn't have any church buildings. And uh, the church, first church buildings showed up uh, centuries later. Somebody said they were up in the Amish land the other day and said up there in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And the Amish don't have church buildings. It does not exist. Say, so where do they meet? They meet in this house, then in that house, then in this house, then in this house. I was up there one time behind this big trailer, and the trailer was packed full of pews. The pews were where they moved from one place to the next. Whichever Sunday they're going to have a meeting, that's where they carry the pews so the people can sit. So they don't build church buildings. They don't have to upkeep church buildings. They don't have anything of that nature like we do. And uh, you say, well, now, wait a minute. Where's that in the Bible? Where are church buildings in the Bible? <laughs> you see what I mean? It's not in there. Well, is it wrong to have a church building? No. No, I don't see anything where it's wrong. But I think a lot of it relates to your culture. The time that you're living is 2013. The time element that you live in. So it's obvious that from passages in the Bible, you absolutely are forced to put them in a time slot 
and understand what they're talking about and who they're talking to. Go not from house to house, he says. He says that you should not prophesy. He says that you should not preach. And uh, in the book of Zechariah, in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 8, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. But we know that's not uh, the case right now. We know that's not so. We know the, the, uh, the, uh, the covenant that he's talking about, the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel in those days. What I'm trying to say to you this morning is this. There are certain things in the Bible, and many of them, that force me to be a dispensationalist. Now, here's how they handle that text that I just read to you where he said, uh, sell, what you, sell your garment and buy a sword. They said, well, they spiritualized that. They said what he means by that is that, you know, sell what you've got so you can equip yourself with the word of God, which is the sharp two-edged sword, and go out and preach the gospel. Well, that all sounds good. That's not what it said. And not only that, but in the context of it, it clearly doesn't mean that. What he's saying is, they have rejected me and they have rejected the kingdom. I'm preparing you for what's coming. Arm yourself. That's what he said. In plainer words, the kingdom of heaven that they rejected, along with the king that they rejected, has now been pulled back. And the ministry of the word of God has taken on a completely new focus and you will you must prepare yourself for what's coming. And uh, just a little before that, the Lord Jesus told Peter, he said, put up your sword for they that live by the sword will die by the sword. And he cut off the ear of Malchus, he cut his ear off. The Lord put his ear back on. But just a little while later, it all changes when the when the line had been crossed, never to be crossed back over again. And now he tells them to arm themselves. There's quite a bit about this in the Bible. In John 18, 36, I read to you where he said, Then would my servants fight. Are they ever going to fight? Look at Revelation 19 and verse 11, the book that most Protestant denominations stay out of. <coughs> they do, folks. And they're amillennial and postmillennial. They spiritualize the whole book. In Revelation 19, 11, if you look at, on down to verse number 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Now, you can spiritualize that sword and say, well, that's the Word of God. It certainly is the Word of God. No question about that. No, no, doubt, no doubt about that. But he's smiting the nations. And why is he smiting them? He's smiting them because he is taking by force the kingdoms of this world, which will never be offered up by man. Man will never relinquish the kingdoms of this world to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not going to happen. So he will come and take them by force. Man will never, by his own free will, subject himself to the authority of the Son of God. So the Lord Jesus Christ will rule them with a rod of iron. He will subjugate them by force. Force of arms. If you want to look back in the Old Testament, the book of Joel, it even talks about the armies as they come down at the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as they conquer one foe after another. Satan himself as carnate in the Antichrist at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, he will literally bring the Antichrist out and stretch him out in front of his subjects and a fire will come out from that creature in the midst of all of the people around and consume him, his body, right there in front of them and then he himself will be cast into the lake of fire. That's at the second advent. The Lord Jesus Christ will come back in flaming fire, the Bible says, taking vengeance on them that know not God. So we're in grace right now, and grace is mercy, and hallelujah to God for it. But it, uh, it leads into war. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter number 12 that there is war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The wars are yet to come, as it's been said time and time again. The best and greatest wars are yet to come. 
if you could call war something, you know, best and great. But war is coming. And a war like, unlike this earth has ever known before. Because World War III, that, uh, that uh, Pike, uh, what's his first name? Uh, I can't think of it. Who? Albert Pike. Albert. Albert Pike uh, supposedly prophesied uh, back in the 1800s. He talked about three world wars. And that this third world war is coming. And it's coming. It's going to come. It's coming. And we've probably already seen the first shots fired. You know, as they say, the shot across the bow. The first shots have been fired. And uh, right now, obviously, I mean, unless you live in a cave, you understand the American financial system is on the brink. And that uh, they're being told now by economists and by the people who study this stuff that if America allows its debt to default, default simply means that they won't, that they're not able to pay their bills. And when that means all the bonds that have been issued and the, and the United States dollar is the world currency, world reserve currency. It used to be the British pound sterling. Now it's the American dollar. And it's the world uh, reserve currency. What if you are a Chinaman or what if you are an Italian or whatever, and you're holding American dollars as a, as a reserve currency because of their value, and all of a sudden America defaults on its debt. It debt its debt comes due, and it's not paid. They say that it could, put the, it could plunge the world into a deep recession or even possibly a depression. Which, of course, is a, is a time of chaos and a time of, of uh, a turmoil. And, that, and out of that always rises in a vacuum. Any time a vacuum is created, a monster will arise. A monster will arise. So in any event, the world is ready and ripe for World War III. And it's coming. And when it comes, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come. I firmly believe that. And he will come and he will take the kingdoms of this world away from the Antichrist and from Satan. And so obviously, being a premillennial as I am, I do not believe for a minute that the church is going to convert the world. The world has converted the church. That's fact. That's fact. So, when we come back to what we're talking about here, look at this thing. In John 18, verse 36, he said, Then would my servants fight. Revelation 19, verse 15, When the Lord Jesus comes back, he comes back with a sword coming forth from his mouth. In Luke chapter number, in, uh, in uh, Revelation chapter number 11 and verse number 3, when the two witnesses show up, Revelation 11, 3, I will give power to my two witnesses. Verse 4, these are the two olive trees, candlesticks, standing before the God of the whole earth. If any man will hurt them, Fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. See that? Now go back to the book of Luke, chapter number 9, verse 54, and hold your place there. And remember what those uh, disciples said to the Lord? Luke 9, 54. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, saw what? They saw the way the Samaritans treated him. When they saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven? And consumed them as Elias did. And that's exactly what Elijah did. He called fire down from heaven. The fact that the fire came down from heaven when Elijah called it down from heaven. It's obvious that the Lord God himself was putting his stamp of approval upon his man. And the Lord was party to it. He was part of what was going on. But over here... When the Lord Jesus Christ is ministering the kingdom of heaven to these people, a passive, resist not evil. And they said, let us call fire down from heaven. He said, not so. You don't know what spirit you're of. We didn't come to destroy man. See over here, verse number 50, uh, 55. You know what spirit you're of, verse 56. The Son of Man has not come to destroy, but to save them. So, you see, you see... Uh, I do not believe there are any contradictions in the Bible, folks. My, the contradictions are always in my head until God can give me understanding and wisdom in the thing. Always. Uh, the, arrogant, the arrogant one is the one who approaches the Bible on, with the idea that he is so smart that, uh, that you know, by, just by simply perusing the Scripture, he can find all these contradictions in the Word of God. Few of them have ever read it themselves. 
you will find that most atheists and most agnostics have never read the Bible. Oh, they might have read some Sunday school lesson here or there. They read somebody's book about the Bible. Uh, Payne, I think his name was, uh, Reason. He wrote a book back in the 1700s about Reason. Uh, John Payne, Thomas, Thomas Payne, uh, he wrote a book back in, the, back in the 1700s about reason. It's the idea, you know, that we are reasonable creatures. And if this doesn't fit my concept or perception of what reason is about, then I kick it out. That's the whole idea. So he created a whole generation of agnostics and atheists. Well, what we have following him is uh, Charles Darwin. When Darwin goes off in the, in the HMS Beagle and goes down to the Galapagos Islands, and by his, by his pea brain, he observes by his own intellect what he thinks is a process of evolution. Then he writes his book on or the origin, natural origin, origin of, uh, what's it called? Species, the natural origin, of natural selection, something like that. The origin of the species, or it's one of those titles, or the natural selection, whatever. He writes this book. It's a handbook on evolution. He writes this, and when he does this, the people who are looking for something so they don't have to give an account to God grabbed it, snatched it up. Now it has become their Bible. They still haven't read the Bible. Next time you see an atheist or an agnostic, look him eyeball to eyeball and say, Have you ever read the Bible? Because the Word of God is powerful. They get very uncomfortable reading the Bible. They would never admit that. Oh, no, no. They're too smart for that. They're, they're very cunning. But when they pick up that book and start reading that book, that book starts reading them. And they know it. That's why they treat the Bible like the plague. So, when I believe the Bible, I do not believe there are any contradictions in the Bible. I believe that by study, rightly dividing the word of truth, great truths will emerge from Scripture. Just like that one, for example. Somebody says to you, well, now, you know, you don't have any business trying to arm yourself or have arms in your house. And if so, an intruder breaks into your house and, and grabs your wife and your children, why, well, you know, I mean, you don't have any, like Dukakis up there in uh, Massachusetts. I guess he's a prime example of a progressive liberal 30 years ago. And uh, it was that idea. If they come in they, and they, they rape your wife or your children, murder your family, well, you, have to resi- you, you can't resist them. Because he said, turn the other cheek. What would you tell them? Well, after I've just said, what would you say to somebody like that? If they told you. <laughs> You'd say, well, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he had been rejected by his people, and when his kingdom had been rejected, turned to his disciples and said, take that cloak. If you don't have the money, tell, sell that cloak you're wearing and buy a sword. And then one of his disciples said, Lord, here are two swords. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, that's enough. Be prepared. I send you forth armed to the teeth. Because in that day they were armed to the teeth. Now, if they're armed, why would they be armed? They're armed to defend themselves or to defend their families. That's why the Second Amendment was so important about this country, because they knew that once you live in a totalitarian society, a dictatorship, once you come from a European church church state as they had back in those days, and you come over here from persecution, you know that one of the greatest blessings and benefits that any man can have is that ability to bear arms. And we hold these truths to be self-evident, yeah. that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We hold these truths to be inalienable. What's that mean? That means not, they're God-given, not man-given. Governments will always pick, 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 cut, pick, 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 and rob you of your rights that are God-given. Under the premise that it's going to make you safer. Well, this sure didn't make those kids safer at Sandy Hook, did it? And the gun-free zone over here at Virginia Tech, when that murdering monster went in there and shot those kids to death sitting at their table, it didn't make them safe either, did it? What they ought to say when they say gun-free zone, no sitting duck zone. That's what that means. Sitting duck. Broadcast to the world. We bought the lie. We're going to sit here and we're not armed. Come in and kill us. 
And that's the bottom line. If you let somebody come into your house and rape your family and kill your children, and you stood by and let that happen, you'll give an account to God Almighty. You'll give an account to Him. That's all I can say. And I would hate to be a wife or a child uh, of, a, of, a, of a family where I didn't know if my parent would, would defend me, would be there to stop some murderer, some killer, some rapist. And folks, this is the day of home invasions. And they tried to kick my door down one time about 20 years ago, right up here on Woodrow Drive. I speak first person. Two men came to that door and they started kicking that door. I could hear it all over the house. They weren't knocking on that door. They were kicking that door. Do you know what I did? I took Mr. Smith and Mr. Wesson with me. And I wanted them to see it. I said, hey, you see this thing I got in my hand right here? And they looked through the window. They said, let us in. Where somebody's coming after us. I said, you're not coming in here. with. If they are after you, you're not coming in this house. Would you let them in your house? If somebody's coming after them to kill them and they come into your house, they'll kill you. So I looked at them and I said, here it is, my hand. Look at it, boys, right here. You're not coming through that door. And then just a few minutes later, they left. And we called the law. We wanted the law. But you see, they could have done what they wanted to do long before the law ever got there. That was Preacher Lawson talking to them. <laughs> now we'll have prayer meeting. <laughs> that was a long time ago. But that was a reality. That's a reality of the world you live in right now, folks. Don't live, don't live in la-la land. Don't live in fairy tale land. This is a vicious society. And the law will not protect you. And they will kick your door down. They will drag you out of your car. I've got one granddaughter, and I thank God, scared to death. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad I've got her scared to death. She was talking to this boy of UT the other day, and he is so naive, it's not funny. She parked her car over there at UT. They tore... You know these these things they, that, that are on the back of them, they call them spoilers. Somebody came through and ripped it off of her car. And then I think they busted a glass or something out. Parked over here at UT. You know what they go to UT for, don't you? They go over here to get an education, right? Doesn't that culture them, make them better and all that? They're just educated monsters if they're not saved. Ripped it off of her car. That's scary, isn't it? When you think somebody's stalking you. These monsters today think that they can walk right into a church house, walk in like you're sitting here right now, walk in with a gun, and just hold hostage three or four hundred people, and just walk down here and take your offering, and just walk out the back door with it. Well, I wouldn't fight over the money. But if he took hold of one of anybody, somebody in this house... Your daughter or your wife, would you fight over your daughter or your wife? Well, what I'm trying to do this morning is give you scriptural authority to do it. <laughs> I'm trying to show you in the Bible what the Lord Jesus Christ said, get a sword. But also along with that, it also just absolutely forces you to look dispensationally at the scripture. Because a certain time comes to an end, then it starts up and goes to another one, then it goes and goes and goes and goes. And that's what we're dealing with. The Bible says that we live now in the age of the dispensation of the grace of God. Thank God for that. Somebody says, well, now, you know, I don't, I don't believe in using arms. Well, that's up to you. Everybody's individual. You have to, you know, that's between you and the Lord. I'm not going to. That's between you and God. I can't live your life for you. You can't live your life for me. Every man has to be fully persuaded in his own mind. Uh, I've been there. I know what I'd do. I know what would happen. It, 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 it would get violent if, if it had to. And I just, uh, you know, that's all I can say to you. That's just the way it is. And it's not going to be any other way. And uh, that's the way it is. And uh, 
uh, if they take your Second Amendment right away from you in this nation, take your guns away from you, you're finished. You're done for. Because then they can do anything they please with you and the government will not protect you and the thieves will kick your door down and come in and take you away. They'll take everything you've got. If, you, if they know that you're not armed, that's exactly what's going to happen. And that's, uh, and that's where it's headed, too, if something doesn't change. Let me give you three things that have happened in the past. These are historical events. But you think about this for a minute. In 732 A.D., at the Battle of Tours, Charles Martel stopped the Muslim hordes, the onslaught of Islam. In 1571, the naval battle of Lepanto, they stopped the Ottoman Empire from expanding across the Mediterranean Sea. In 1683, at the gates of Vienna, they defeated the Ottoman Empire that had gathered tens of thousands of troops outside the gates of Vienna, which is modern is Austria. Now, for a period of 951 years, at least, the Muslims pushed into Europe. They pushed and they pushed and they pushed and they pushed. These are the major battles. Many more battles were fought. They were fighting the Muslims to stop them from coming into, quote unquote, Christian Europe. See what I mean? They were stopping them because the Muslim had one thing in mind. He was going to convert Europe into Islam. By the sword. You better believe it, by the sword. He didn't come with a Bible in his hand preaching evangelism. He came with a sword. That's the way they do it. They still do it that way. Today they use bombs, machine guns, you know, whatever the whatever they can get a hold of. Down here in Kenya just a few days ago, which was, wasn't reported on much in the United States at all, in Kenya, a bunch of Somalis went into a, went into a, a, a shopping mall down there and, and shot up a bunch of people, killed 70 or 80 people. And it, some of the stuff that you read about what they did to those people, oh, it's horrible what they did to them, some of them. Horrible what they did to some of those people. They came in fully armed, ready, armed to the teeth. These poor people in their shopping were just in their shopping. A bunch of kids sitting up there. But they massacred those people. Who did it? Muslims did it. Muslims. Muslims. So, uh, had it not been for the battle's fault, and that's the point, if the battles had not been fought, then Europe may very well have fallen before the hordes of uh, the Ottoman Empire and, and, and Islam. And had that happened, what do you think you'd be right now? What would you be, what would you be reading? Think about it. Think about it. To me, uh, you know, wars are fought for a lot of different reasons. Wars are fought to gain ground. Wars are fought for economic reasons, to gain resources. Wars are fought because of religious problems, so forth. To me, the most important reason to go to war is to stop a Muslim or to stop somebody from trying to convert my children into a pagan religion. That would be a reason to go to war in a heartbeat. You better believe it. That would be a reason to go to war. You say, well, does God back wars? He backed them in the Old Testament. Joshua went to war with the Lord God on his side. Don't you remember outside of Ai? When he stood out there and he said, as the captain of the host of the Lord, am I come? The Lord God met Joshua. Joshua was a fighter, folks. He was a warrior. So was David. That's why the Lord wouldn't let David build the, the, the uh, he wanted to build a temple. He wouldn't let him build it because he was a warrior. Then we have that interim period where the kingdom of God is preached. But that period has come to an end. We're not preaching the kingdom of God. You know, the Beatitudes, they're wonderful things. And the time's going to come, as I showed you earlier in the text, where when the kingdom of, uh, kingdom of heaven, rather, when the kingdom of heaven comes down, when the Lord Jesus comes and brings that kingdom, make no mistake about it, they're going to march to his tomb. <laughs> there will be peace on earth. There will be peace on earth. 
when the Lord Jesus Christ reigns in from Jerusalem. But until that time, there will be wars and rumors of wars. <laughs> and you're right now facing that. Uh, did you know that since the government shut down just a few days ago, that 17, 17 Americans have died in Afghanistan? You don't hear much about it, but I just happened to get that number because they mentioned that as it relates to the, as to, as it relates to the government shutdown. Uh, you know, I said the other day, the government has shut down. Maybe it moved. Wouldn't that be a good thing? If it moved over to Italy, I know they wouldn't want it. Maybe it'd go to Greece somewhere. Move it over to Russia. Bring Putin over here. What do you think? Just kidding you. Putin is supposed to be a Russian Orthodox Christian. That's what he says he is. And he goes to their to their meetings and all that. And I've seen many. All you got to do is get on the Internet and type his name in. Uh... The man we've got in the White House right now, folks, if the Lord God doesn't do something this nation, to put somebody in there when his term is expired, somebody that's a patriot to this country, somebody that loves America, loves America, somebody that will cross his heart when the, when the, the, the uh, national anthem is played, because I've seen more than one photograph of him standing there just like this on that national anthem to the colors is played. So stand in there. Pardon? Yeah, he may not even be an American. <laughs> There's a lot of doubt about his birth certificate and all that. Uh, you know, the fact of the matter is a lot of people out there believe he's a Kenyan. His grandmother says he was. She said she was there when he was born. Be that as it may, you know, the birth certificate thing is, is moot now. It's moot. Because unless it relates to the the legislation of the executive orders that might relate to that if something can be found out about it. But the bottom line is he has so much time left and then a new president will be elected. This is time for you to start praying about your nation, praying about the country. I was watching the broadcast the other day and said there's 100 million Christians in America. I don't know if that's true or not. That's an awful big figure. I think that's I think that's very. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's a lot of wishful thinking in that, don't you think? But in any event, let's say that's 100 million Christians in America. Let's just throw that figure out. The population of America is what, about 330, something like that? 330 million. If you have a voting block of 100 million people, folks, you can put anybody in office you want to. You don't have to be a Republican or a Democrat, Whig or whatever. You can put anybody in office you want to. Uh, how many votes did Obama get in the last election? 68, 63. I'm trying to remember. It seems like it was 63 to 65 million, and McCain got 55 million popular vote. Okay? Think about what I just said. Obama got 63 million votes, and McCain got 55 million votes, and Obama was elected president. Can you imagine if you had 100 million people voting? Well, it'd be a no-brainer. Rubber stamp. You think that's going to happen? Okay. Here's the bottom line. If the salt has lost its savor, and we are the salt of the earth, if the light has been put out, then the last thing that keeps a country afloat and keeps any life in that nation is the church. Once the church is no, once the church doesn't matter anymore. Then there's nothing left, is there? Okay. I hope a lesson like I've given you this morning uh, ought to help you. It ought to help you. I would, to me, what the Lord Jesus said there is very important. It's all important. All important. Because that shows me that the authority comes from God and not men. It's all important. So, so uh, take it to heart. And uh, may God bless you. Brother Lee, will you dismiss us, please?